Good evening and welcome to Carleton University. My name is Rafiq Gubran. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Design. Welcome to the 2015 Roadmaps Lecture featuring, featuring Dr. Zach El Ramli. Please note that tonight's lecture will be videotaped so that the ideas discussed here can be shared with Carlton graduates, future Carlton students, and other students around the world who are also thinking about their career path. Roadmaps is a lecture series founded in part by Carlton alumni. It examines the path global leaders and entrepreneurs have followed from their university education to professional success. Once graduates walk out of our doors, the path they take are always unique, usually predictable, and very often in inspiring. To help you on your route from the classroom to an outstanding career, I hope that you will find lessons, surprises, and inspiration in the path chosen by those who have gone before you. Tonight's lecture should help you realize how choices can open the many doors that your Carlton degree offers you. The 2015 Roadmaps Lecture is presented by an outstanding Carlton alumnus, Dr. Zach El Ramli, who earned both a master's degree and a PhD degree from the Faculty of Engineering and Design here at Carlton. Immediately after leaving Carlton, Zach started at BC Hydro in 1977, eventually moving up to Executive Vice President of Marketing in PowerX, the Power Organizations Trading Group. At PowerX, Dr. Ramli was in on the ground floor of a new power trading market that was developing out of deregulation in California and in Alberta. The newly deregulated power market had created a demand for someone who understood energy commodities and trading so that, uh, that Zach went to work as a consultant with almost instantaneous success. He started ZE Power Corp uh, at that time. When ZE Power started looking for software to track and analyze stock prices, they could find no suitable product. In his usual style, Zach decided to find a team to create his own software, and ZE Market Analyzer, or Zima, was released. Zima is now being used by some of the largest energy traders, business analysts, oil and gas companies in the whole world. The company was named Data Management House of the Year 2009 and 2010 by Energy Risk, the magazine for commodity traders and risk managers. Zach is also the author of Zachism, Zach's Simple Lessons of Life. I have that small book and I looked at it quite a few times when you gave it to me four years ago. <laughs> I'm delighted to have Zach with us as a successful executive and entrepreneur with experience in power industries, regulation, and the power market. Zach understands what it takes to both create and operate large businesses, and how to take advantage of changes in policies, policies and in politics. He has proven insight into developing and bringing to market products that organizations need and use on a regular basis. Tonight, he will share with us the roadmap that led from engineering to CEO. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Zakir Ramli. Is it good evening or good afternoon? <laughs> Somewhere in between. Thank you, Dr. Rafiq, and thank you all for coming, and thank Cartoon for inviting me. When I got the invitation, of course, I couldn't uh, say no. I shouldn't say no. I didn't know what I was going to talk about, but I was sure that I'm going to find something to talk about. <laughs> Then I got a message, something like, you don't have to talk about your product and your company, you just talk about your experience and your life and so on. So I came up with the idea that I'm going to try to share with you. If I remember how to do, I can't find the tab, but. Oh. So I'm trying to show you how you translate your vision to success or in effect, why you need a vision. I believe that life is like a GPS. You know. Your vision is according to your destination. So your vision tells you where you're going to go. Okay. We are more controlled than we think. A lot of us cruise not realizing that you can change direction and you can control where you want to go anytime you want. Without a vision or destination, you still you know where you are. 
a lot of people who don't have a vision still know who they are. However, without a vision, you may not like your location, you damn your job and hate your job and wonder why you go to work every day. You may be cruising aim aimlessly, changing from one job to another to another, or you may let the other control you. Or you may be lucky that your location is your destination, which is fine, but that's still the case. So just like a destination, a vision can change again and again and again. So you can get to a destination, and then once you get there, you can have another vision or another destination. Uh, I was <coughs> driven here by a taxi driver from Ethiopia, and he was curious, and he started asking me about what am I talking about, why am I here, and so on, and, and I started talking to him. And he realized that he's stuck in what he's doing because he's not looking outside what else he could do. So what's a vision? A vision, as I define it, is a visualization of a far state. In the future, I want to get this done. In the future, I want to be there. Okay. However, for it to be a vision, you have to believe it could happen. You have to believe that I want to be there, and it could happen. You have to have the desire to make it happen. Sometimes we're too lazy to have a desire. Okay? A lot of times, our desire stops us from, you know, you know, we don't desire enough. You have to have confidence in your ability to get there. And what that term confidence is very, very important. You have to have confidence. How you have confidence? Just have confidence. And you have to be willing to expand the effort required to get there. You don't just get to your destination without driving, without looking, without doing so. You have to, you have to put the effort into getting there. And you have to have the discipline to stay the course. Because sometimes when you're going there, you find that the road is closed or something is happening and so on, and you don't just get there right away. There are obstacles in the way. So you have to have the discipline to stay the course to get to your destination or to your vision. If you don't have all these, a vision is just a dream. We all have dreams, and you don't translate into vision. So you can read a lot of books about setting objective, about vision, and so on, and they teach you a lot. At Carlton, I was doing an experiment. I was an experimentalist. So I want to provide evidence to you. I want to provide you with experimental evidence that my thesis about the need for a vision is correct. I'll use my life trajectory to show you that when I had a vision, I read that vision. I didn't, I didn't get to any place by coincidence, actually. I don't know why, but when I look back, when I, when I decided to look at this lecture and think about my life, and it actually was very taxing. So preparing it was very taxing because you have to analyze what you did before, what you right, what you wrong, are you in the right place, are you happy with what you are? So I had to look at this trajectory. And I found out that yes, whenever I had a vision, I got to my vision, and that's what I want to share for you. If you have a vision, you can get there. And because I believe in the power of vision, I can actually recollect or remember when I made a certain decision to do something. So it's much easier for me to talk to you and convince you that yes, at this point I decided to do the following and because of that I got to where I want to be. So Dr. Rafik talked about the zakisms. So I give you the principle I live by. And the zakism is something that I observed in my life and I wrote it down because my friends told me that's eloquent or that's unique or wow, so I write it down and then I look at it again and again and try to see if it's really correct and if it's correct, I call it a sarcasm. If it's not correct, I throw it away. Okay, you need a vision or goal to guide you. Vision provides the drive. Humans are made of the same genes. This is very important for you to remember. Humans are made of the same genes. I and you are capable of anything that anybody else could do, except for physics, okay? You are as capable as anybody else. You're also as vulnerable as anybody else. Just like somebody could be a Bill Gates, you can be a Bill Gates if you want to be a Bill Gates, and if you had the same starting point as Bill Gates. If somebody takes drugs, you can take drugs, okay? So if you do what others did, you'll likely get to the same place. So if you believe in that, then you can look at all the people around you and see what they do and what it gets them, what they do and what gets them. And as a result, you can make a choice about what you need to do yourself because you have examples of all the people around you. Okay? And I believe a lecture like this gives you an example. I hope it gives you an example that 
you could do what I could do or you could do what anybody else could do. And as human, we are more capable than we think. We hear that, oh, we only use 3% of the brains, we use 10% of the energy, we believe me, as humans, we all are underperforming. So if you believe that, you realize you're underperforming. You could do a lot more than what you're doing right now. And most importantly, life is driven by basic principles. There is not a lot of things to learn about life, or at the very least, if you learn something today, you can take it with you. So experience is portable, is transferable, and transportable. So the, the driver that I was talking to was some kind of a medical whatever, and he said, I could not get into uh, the hospital. I could not be a registered nurse. I couldn't. I said, why be a registered nurse? Why don't you look at something else, a different career, a different something? You're here now. You made the leap all the way from Ethiopia to Ottawa. Can you make a leap from being a taxi driver or something else, or a leap from going from Ottawa to another place that will get you there? Why are you stuck into your older ones? Anyhow, just to demonstrate my point, and I learned that when I was at Carlson. There is one equation called the Laplace equation. That equation is used for determining heat transfer, fluid mechanics, electric systems, stress analysis, a lot of things. And the only difference between one field and the other is the boundary conditions. So in effect, the basic science, or some of the basic science, are driven by one single equation. OK, so I'll give you two seconds. It's better for you to know where you want to go, you're lost, but you know where you're going to go, than to know exactly where you are, but don't know where to go. Okay? So I say it again. It's better for you to be lost, but you know where you're going to go, because you're going to go home and home and home until you get there, than to know exactly where you are, but you don't know where you're going to go, because you're going to be stale where you are. Great people are ordinary people who are willing to take a great challenge. We all are ordinary people. I'm an ordinary person. You, no way in, under the sun I thought at any time that I was not an ordinary people. There is no way under the sun I don't think right now that I'm not an ordinary person. I'm an ordinary person. We all are ordinary people. It's what you decide to take is what makes you. So if you take a great job, great challenge, you become a great person. You don't take a great challenge, you don't become a great person. And if you have an objective, the closer you get to it, the more it drives you towards it. So you just have to try to get there. And the best way of looking at this is the Olympics, OK? People that fizzle out, that's OK, they fizzle out. But people who are second or third, they really are mad because you didn't get to the top, OK? So as you get closer and closer to your goal, it actually drives you more and more towards that goal. So what I am today, I am just a family member that have a family trust, and I have a few companies to the left is the ZE Power Engineering, the one that Dr. Rafiq talked about it. The one in the middle is just a, a structure to offer services to the software that we develop globally, just for legalities. And the one to the right is something I was driving by and I got it, just one of those coincidences where I bought a share in, or a majority shares in a small engineering firm that grew from being one person to being 40 people in the last 10 years. Just as coincidence, not a vision, not a focus, OK? And because we operate globally, we have to establish companies in the UK and in Singapore. That's just the corporate structure. When we started developing Zima, when we went all the way to developing the product called Zima, we realized that we need a vision. So what's the vision for Zima? So the vision for Zima was to be recognized as the leading global provider of enterprise data management. We knew the field we want to be in, we knew that we have to be recognized, and we wanted to be in globally, not locally. We wanted to be supported by a global presence. We didn't believe that in the field that we've chosen, it's enough to just do it in North America, so global was added to it. I like control, so I wanted to be attained through self-funding, because if you get somebody's money, you get somebody's control. So our principle was, no, we have to do it with our own money. If we cannot do it with our own money, we shouldn't do it. Good, better, and different, I don't care. That was the vision. Okay. And we knew that 
once you do something unique, everybody will catch up with you. So you have to always stay there. So we have to do research and development all over, all the time in order to stay ahead. This is just the reality of the situation. In software development, if you don't keep moving, keep moving iPhone 6, iPhone 7, iPhone 8, somebody will come and take your client. Okay. Uh, we do, this is commercial, we do data, data collection. So we collect data from all over the world. Anywhere there is data that's needed for trading activity or for managing commodity trading, we collect that. So we're like the Google of the industry in this area. And then we do analytics. And the reason we do analytics is that because we take the raw data, analyze it, and make it more useful. Okay, so we just add usefulness to the data. And we do integration because in this day and age, there's a ton of information. And you also have to learn how to move the information around if you want to be useful. Okay? And the history of the company, you add something, and then you add something, and you add something. And you, know, you don't just start one day, and you're big. You start small, and you grow if you stay the course, and you sustain your effort. Uh, we're about 100, 200 employees in this company, the one that does the software. We have about 80 clients worldwide. We operate 24-7. And we have clo clo global client base, and our clients are themselves global. And as Dr. Rafiq said, we won a lot of awards. And by the way, it's five times in a row, not twice, five times in a row. And to us, getting the awards was a way of making sure that we're doing something that's appreciated by the industry. So we ask ourselves every year, how, what would it take to win next year? You can't just keep winning because you're the smartest. You have to be different. So we ask ourselves every year, how, what, did you do, what do we do in order to win? OK, so how did I get there? What is my technical resume? How did I get there? How did I get from being a kid to being a CEO? Actually, seven CEOs, but <laughs> just because I have a lot of, lot of little companies that <laughs> need it for work. OK? I got to be seeing mechanical engineering power in 1964. I'm just almost at the same stage as most of you. Why did I become an engineer? That I don't collect, recollect very well. I just know that my family wanted me to be a lawyer because I was good at talking. And in Egypt, at that time, being a lawyer was not good enough, so anyhow, so I became an engineer. Then I became an assistant lecturer from 1964 to 1968, and I did some part-time work as a HVAC designer. Then I went to Kuwait, National Petroleum Company, and I went, uh, worked as an instrumentation engineer for a year. Then I came to Carlton and did a master's degree in detonation and shock waves. Then I did a PhD in aeronautical engineering, flight safety. Then I did two years of research at Carlton in flight safety. Then I left and went to BC Hydro. And I went from being a guy with a PhD to being an assistant engineer first. And I moved all the way till I became executive vice president for the subsidiary PowerX. And then I started the Power Group. When I started the Power Group, I started as a consultant in a competitive market. No software. Then we developed the Zima software. And then I got the engineering company. Just look at how many fields did I cover in all the, in these years, OK? In about 50 years of history, how many fields? I was in a power engineering, HVAC, in instrumentation, shockwaves, flight safety, rate setting, utility planning, software development, consulting. And I can tell you, I have, I have never felt incompetent in any of these. I never felt hesitation. Not because I'm smart, nothing. It's just because you know that life is same basic principle. If you become a manager, you become a manager. There are elements of management, and just like Laplace equation. If you move from mechanical to civil, it's the same equation, even though it looks like you move from mechanical to civil. A lot of things in life are of that nature. You learn, and once you learn, you can use what you learned again and again. So how do I write my resume as a vision? Okay. What is the trigger point? Trigger point was I want to be an engineer. And I started talking about that. I realized I was out of order, so I came back. I want to be an engineer because at the time, you apply to universities, and depending on your grades, they take you. 
and the grades and the university or the degree that you get reflects the salary you get. So engineering was the best job there is in Egypt at the time. So I decided to be an engineer. My daughter is an engineer. And I found out why she decided to be an engineer. She was actually receiving a, like a government award in for Canada's 125 year, whatever. So she was receiving an award. And she was interviewed by the local newspaper. And I overheard her saying that when I was at Carlton, I used to bring them here to this place. And there used to be an open buffet. And the kids can go in room and eat whatever they want. There was a brand new gym that I would take them to the gym. She comes to my office and I have a huge big office beside the wind tunnel. So for her, engineering was great. <laughs> so that's how her, her, her vision was, was developed, <laughs> by being <laughs> a daughter of somebody at Carlton and by being at a good place at Carlton at the same time, the open buffet, the gym, and all of that. So now, when I was in my fourth year engineering, we have to do a project. You do a project, you do a practical project. So the project for me was heating and air conditioning a whole hotel and developing the system. And to do that, they bring an external examiner, somebody with real life experience. And of course, you have your professor. These are two guide you in doing your project. The external examiner, my professor, or of the classmates, okay? My professor was a professor. And in Egypt, that's a stasher. He's a professor. The other guy was a businessman, so he made the money. The guy that made the money hated the other guy for having the credibility, and the guy whose credibility hated the other guy for being so rich. And I realized, oh my gosh, nobody's happy. But what am I going to do? I don't know which way I'm going to feel. So I decided I'm going to get my PhD. Because it's not something I can get when I'm 60. It's something I can get now. I don't know if I want it, but I must get it. Otherwise, my vision of myself in the future may be that of somebody who's regretting what he is. So I decided to get a PhD. That's it. Focused, OK? So you start applying for universities, and you get accepted. And I got accepted different places, including Carlton. Guess what? I was living in, living in Egypt in 1967, and the war started. When it started, we couldn't get out. So the universities gave up on us because we keep applying and we don't go and so on. So that's when I decided, the hell was it? I'm going to leave Egypt and I'm going to go somewhere that allows me the mobility to go wherever I want, whenever I want. So I went to Kuwait. I went to Kuwait and I got a job there. And in Kuwait at the time, 1968, they paid very well because nobody wants to go to Kuwait at the time. Very bad country, very hot, whatever. At the time, it was really yucky. So you give you a lot, a lot of money. So I went there, and I got a lot of money. And I found out that people who stayed there have even more money, because you don't know what to spend it on. So you go to Europe, and so on, and a lot of money. And I asked myself, my gosh, this money is a gold cuffs. I want to go and get my degrees. So I left after the first year of contract, and I came to Carlton. I came to Carlton with $2,500, OK? and a kid, and my wife's hello. Why did I come to Carlton? It's because also, when I was working as a, an assistant lecturer at, at Carlton, uh, sorry, at NJAMS University where I graduated, and I was working part-time as an engineer, I found it very hard for me to get paid for what I do. But the country was very structured. So I started looking for, where do I live? Which place should I choose to live? One in KBHD, and you want a place to live, there was only four choices, OK? Australia, England, UK, sorry, England, US, and Canada. Those were the places that will pay for somebody to come and do research. Everybody else wants you to pay them, but those four countries would pay you. So those are the guys that were attracting the talents. Yes, no. Because at the time, if you remember in the 60s, there was the blacks and whatever it is. No, that's not a vision of my country I want to live in. The British were kind of lazy and so on. And it's a good place to go, but the lazy guys, I don't want to be lazy like them. Okay, Australia was too far away, and Canada was almost the perfect balance between the States and London and, and, and UK. So I chose to come to Canada, and that's why I communicated only with Canadian universities. So anyhow, so I. I came to Canada, and I learned something there. 
which I was trying to say to you that human or like alike and so on. When you come to Canada and you come and you're from outside country and you have an accent and so on and you don't have money and then realize that from day one you're treated like everybody else. And you get everything, you get the same scholarship, you get the same teaching assistant, you get everything and you realize, oh my gosh, okay, this is the land where you can make anything. Okay? This is the land where you can grow because there's no, no restriction but you. They gave me scholarships not for anything other than I was working hard. Not for anything other than I was willing to work. Okay, I was committed to what I'm going to do. So anyhow, I did my master's degree, and it was in detonation and shock tube. And two things I learned. First of all, my professor, his name was Ed Platt, wanted me to go to Princeton. So I went to Princeton, I had an interview, and they wanted me to continue there was at Princeton. And I ask myself, I'm happy. I'm in a good place. Do I really need to go to Princeton? And they say, yeah, oh, you get it from a bigger university. You get the flares and so on. And I said, OK, I'll compensate for the flares with hard work. And dropped Princeton. Second thing is that I did a paper, and it got published. And for a kid to publish a paper in the something of physics society or whatever it is was an achievement. And I went to a room like this to present my paper. And there were three people sitting in my, in the, listening to me. One was half asleep, one didn't know anything about what I'm talking about, and one was asking me a question, and they were all silly questions. And I said, oh my gosh, I don't want to use the word SHIT. So, oh my gosh, is that what I'm doing with my life? No bloody way I'm going to continue in this field. So I decided to do some social good. I decided to do something that actually have at least immediate redeeming value for me. Why? I don't know. I just want to do a social good. I don't want to do a paper on something that I was doing temperature measurement behind a shockwave. Temperature and pressure measurement behind a shockwave. Oh my gosh, who needs to learn about the profile of a detonation shockwave? So I, I decided to do social good. And because of that, I started looking for what would do to do social good. And I landed on work on flight safety. The weak, the small airplane flying by a large airplane and the wake and how it fixes and so on. So that was a very good place for me to start, so I, I did that. Anyhow, that was working fine. I got scholarships and everything. Then came the day of my exam, qualification exam. And I was a good student, known student, happy, everybody knows me, no problem. And I stumbled, okay? stumbled because I had a bad day, or I stumbled because I actually translated something from Arabic to English, and the translation was absolutely ridiculous. So everybody assumed I'm stupid, or I have a bad day. And I could not say, can I revert? I was just translating from Arabic to English, because that would be stupid. So anyhow, the university, knowing my background, gave me a written exam, and I passed the exam, and no problem. My professor, Bill Rimbert, was so smart to know that this may have an impact on me. So what he did, he shipped me around to all research facilities in the world that work on training vertices. So I went to NASA. I went to uh, something by Donaldson, the guys from, anyhow, it's a private facility. And I went to a couple of facilities in London. And guess what? When I traveled there, I found out I knew more about, about things than the, all these guys. I found out that they make stupid, silly mistakes. And I realized right away from that experiment, experience that even me, as a kid, with two or three years experience in aerodynamics, was a good professor, I can learn as much as anybody else in the world. Because I saw them, I talked to them. You, know, you, you go to the guys from NASA, and they make the very simple mistake as they don't realize that the probe that they're using is so big that it destroys the wakes that they're measuring. Like, wow, what are you doing here? Or they're flying an airplane near the ground in order to measure the trailing vortex, not knowing that the, near the ground, it's a completely different environment that's upstream there. So you realize that they make stupid mistakes, and it makes you realize that you yourself is capable as anybody else. And that's where I get the feeling that, yeah, anybody could do anything, OK? Stupid things and good things. So anyhow, so when I finished, working at uh, Carlton, and I did a very good job. And actually, I wrote four papers, and all four papers were published. It was One of them was revision. The next three was whatever. So it was kind of amazing. So I was really, very really successful. 
but I couldn't get a job. And I struggled for two years, and Carlton gave me a, like a, what do you call that, research associate scholarship, and I kept working. I finally landed on three jobs. Just one day, I just landed on one job after the other, after the other. The first job was to be a professor in Virginia University. Do you want me me because of all of my papers? Do you want me to go there and bring them money? So do you want me because of my success? Okay. The second job was a company called Canadair. I applied to Canadair. They didn't take me. They talked to my professor and said, we need somebody. And I said, we have Zach. And said, Zach has a PhD. We don't take people with PhDs. He said, no, no, don't worry. Zach has practical experience. He's not like a typical PhD guy. You can take him. So they made me an offer. And the third one was Mr. Hydro, assistant engineer, not even like entry-level engineer. And I looked at the three. I said, oh my gosh, is he going to pay me almost the same amount of money? What is my objective for the long run? Have a good job, raise my kids, live in a good place. Vancouver it is. So I decided to go to Vancouver. <laughs> and I had some meeting with my professor. They took you for lunch and so on. I remember one of them. I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name. It's too bad. And he told me, Zach, this is a waste of education. And that just got shut in my head. It's a waste of education. And ever since, I've been asking myself, was he right? Look at Chivas. I think he was not. He's right. Look at Chivas. Look at Chivas. Was he right or was he wrong? Actually, no, he was wrong. Because when I went to BC Hydro, I used my knowledge to help BC Hydro. So it's not flight dynamics, but it's knowledge. Knowledge of you can, you know how, you're able, you're capable. This is all knowledge. It's, it's as good a knowledge as knowing how to solve an equation. Okay. And I remember when I was working for BC Hydro, the first approach I did is that you have to realize that you're a guy with a PhD and they all are don't have PhDs. So you 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 gotta teach. You can't just learn, you gotta learn and teach. That's one thing. And I end up in the energy conservation division. And I end up having a couple of good ideas, just normal ideas. You read the papers, you read things, and I have a couple of good ideas about conservation. And we start doing that. So there was a, a NATO conference. And that NATO conference was about energy conservation. It was a trendy there. And I decided to go. And my professor, uh, my, not my professor, my, my boss assumed that I want to go to the NATO conference in Europe because it's close to Egypt, and I want to get a free ride to Egypt. And I told them, the hell with it. I'll pay for it. So he said, OK, you pay for it, you go. So I went. Here is I am in a NATO conference with a lot of people from all over the world. You know what? The knowledge of conservation was as good as mine. Okay. The ideas were as good as mine. Some of them are purely theoretical. Some of it are practical. But with MPC Hydro, in the two or three years I stayed there, I learned enough. So I came back with a vision. The vision is, let's not, can't find a nice word, let's not I'm still going to say a bad word. Let's not fart around with a small little program. Let's make, a, let's make a, a whole inclusive program because there is synergy between different programs. You don't want to do one for residential, one for commercial, one for industrial. That's just a little pieces. If you want to do it, do it all, do it right. And you know what? We're not going to learn from everybody. We know things. I, at least I know things that because I sat with the people like me and I found out what they know. So I came up with a one integrated program. I was lucky. There was a very smart chairman that running the company at the time. He saw the vision, and wow, we created what's now known as a Power Smart program. Okay? So that was a Power Smart program, and it, it came because when I was going back, I swear to God, when I was going back on the airplane, I mapped about 28 pages of here is what you do to create a. So I gave them that, and they looked at what I'm doing, and what I'm doing is probably a little bit too technical. So they needed somebody who's marketing smarts to promote that. So they hired somebody else to run it. And of course, that was not very good with me. So I decided to get away from the track of energy conservation to a different track. Then if it, the company knows me very well. They appreciate me. You realize that it was my accent, was everything, was my stubbornness, was all of that. If you're good, people will like you. Okay. If you're good, people will like you. Don't kid yourself. If people don't like you, it's because you're not good enough for them. So the company did not want me to make me happy. So he gave me another job, and another job, and another job. And every job I took, I looked at it from basic principle. I looked at it and say, 
what did I learn before? How do you make a change? And I had a very successful career at BC Hydro. And because I was successful, I wanted to rise to the top. Because there was no reason why I shouldn't rise to the top. After 17 years, I realized that I am as good as anybody else who's in position. I'm as good as my chairman. I'm as good as the CEO. Really, I am. Really, you are. You probably, everybody is as capable. People who are in top positions are not necessarily geniuses. They're just people who systematically performed until they got that job. They're normal people doing a great job. Okay? So I, I was happy and I was rising to the top until the next job became the president of PowerX. And I'm not politically astute. I don't give them the answers you want. I tell them the answers you should hear. And that's not good when you're working for a government or organization. So they decided to skip me, OK? They tried again and again, and they couldn't find a replacement. But finally, they said, no, no, no. Zach is not suitable to that position. It's fine. Zach is not suitable to that position. So I start thinking about what is my next vision, OK? So I said, I'll start my own business. Because when you're in that position, the headhunter come after you. So the headhunter come and says, can you want to move here or move here? So I said to myself, if headhunters are after me, that means I, I must be of certain value. So why can't I do it? And I'll tell you a small story. The first company that wanted me was in Little Rock, Rock Arkansas. And if you ever flew into Rock, Rock Arkansas, you know what I'm, know, what I'm going to tell you. You go to Little Rock Arkansas, and there's a very long road. And you end there, and it branches into the right and the left. Okay, The right is the black area, and the left is the white area. And that's it. That's the city. And, and I left the place, and I wanted to walk around. And the guy said, no, you don't walk around here. So when I, when I went home, and I explained to my wife what's going on and so on, and she said, if you want to go there, you stay there, and you can commute back and forth. And I said, I'll start my own, my, my own business. Not only will I start my own business, I start asking myself, what would I start my own business for and how? And that was my second, my, my, my next vision. I said, no, no, no. I have a lot of knowledge that I want to transfer it somewhere. OK? So maybe I want to transfer it to my kids. Maybe I want to transfer it to somebody else. But you have knowledge you need to transfer. The best way to transfer knowledge is to have your own company. So that's when I decided I own my company. At the time, was in a consulting area. And then we did the consulting, and we did very well. And then we realized that there is a void in the industry. What is the void? There is not a good software that manages data very well. So that was the vision. Oh, let's do it. So we decided to build Zima, and we decided to do that. And we're successful. And in about 10 years, we're the best companies there is in that particular field. Okay? So it's an achieved an, an objective in a particular field. OK? So after the company became successful, I said, what do I want to build now? I want to build a legacy. I want to make sure that what I've done can stay behind. And then I created the structure that you look, you look at. And I'll give you an example. When we were debating whether we should go to Europe or not, we should, we should open an office in Europe or not, we just went back to the vision. The vision is achieve the brand through global presence. So if you want a global presence, you have to pay for it. So you have to go to Europe. You have to go to Singapore. You have to go here. You have to go there. That's why we want the global. Oh, by the way, I'm now searching for the new vision. Okay? We achieved our vision. We think about that. Say, okay, what, what do we want to do next? Because if we don't know exactly what we want to do next, we're just going to meander. And somebody's going to catch up with us. People are going to get burnt out. So you actually need another vision to take us to the next level. I'll give you a few examples of things that happened at Carlton that were visionary, quite visionary. When I was here back in 1970-something, this was the idea of integrated circuits. And the guys from electric engineering didn't really use drawing boards and so on, so they didn't have that. But somehow they came up with the idea of the great circuit where you draw the circuit on a very big piece of paper, and you take a picture of it, and that's how you make it small, how you miniaturize it. So they had the tables, actually, in the middle of the corridors, because they didn't have enough room with that. One of my friends, whose name was Yusuf Mansi, Dr. Yusuf Mansi, was actually working in there. He went to BNR, and then he went to Intel. He was a vice president at Intel, and he was responsible for making their chips up till two years ago. Okay, so you can see a small something starting Carlton, and before you know it, it was a great thing. 
he's done very well for himself. It was not his vision necessarily, but he managed to, how do you say, make bits to it. Another thing that was at Hydro, at, at Carlton when I was here, was the idea of a wire city. We used to call it the weird city. This is about communicating with Carlton and Stanford so you can share the resources and you can have lectures attended by the classes and so on. You know what this is today? Skype. Okay. Skype is the wire city reduced to everybody have a Skype. Okay. I don't know how much my Carlton made on this particular principle, but Skype is a subset of that. Another idea that was there was a friend of mine, I forgot his last name, and he was work, working with toy trucks, putting them in the wind tunnel, trying to make sure that you can reduce the drag. Okay, it looked like crazy thing. Oh my gosh, you're gonna put that stupid thing on a, on a truck? You look, you look at all the trucks right now? Every one of them has something like that, okay? How much money did somebody make on that? I don't know, is he in the same field? I'm not quite so sure, okay? So, after all this BS, <laughs> am I successful? Is Zach successful? Okay. Yeah, I run several businesses, so I have several businesses. For a lot of people, having business of your own is a success. Okay. I have my family working for me. I have three of my sons and my daughter working for me, and they're all very well advanced. And from my perspective, I am successful because I wanted to give them my knowledge. They do have my knowledge. Not necessarily all of it, but you do have my knowledge. So I managed to convey what I wanted to my sons. And by the way, I consider anybody who works in my organization my son. So in effect, I give my knowledge or my attitude or whatever you want to call it to 200 people right now. And if you integrate over the life of my whatever, it's a thousand years, a thousand people. I remember when I was working for BC Hydro and I had a very nice uh, boss. His name was Ken Epp, still around. And we used to say, what will make us successful? And he used to say to me, if we sit in the Porsche when we're 70, I'm 72, and we can think about all the kids that we've trained. So that stuck with my mind. So when I was working at, BC, at, at GE Power Group, and any time we graduate more people and more people, I feel that's successful. A lot of people feel that this is successful too. So I employ a lot of people, so I must be successful. Well, people think that if you employ a lot of people, you must be successful. I work hard, be out of time and age, and people think that's successful. We have a lot of successful people here, if that's a criteria, and they're all successful, and it's very good. And we have a great product, so we actually brought a product to the marketplace. So unfortunately, it's not an iPhone used by billions of people, it's just an enterprise system used by tens of, people, of corporations. And I'm financially comfortable. I'm not bloody rich, but I'm fine, okay? Do I feel successful? That's different. Does the, does the community consider me successful? That's one thing. Do I feel successful? That's quite different. Yes. Because I achieved my vision. Okay, I exceeded my objective. I always had a target, very clear target, and I get there. That's very fulfilling. Besides the money, whatever it is, that's very fulfilling. So I feel that I have an objective life. Okay. I remain just socially responsible. I pay taxes, I don't cheat. You look at my tax bill, it's high. When I came to Carlton and when I came to Canada, it was amazing. By the time I finished, I had four kids, okay? My four kids were going to daycare, subsidized. When I graduated, I made $18,000 a year. It was not enough money to pay for my kids. Daycare, and I have to go to the daycare. I say, that's crazy. It's now because I'm making an $18,000. You want me to charge me for all my kids for daycare? I can't afford it. They actually extended that. So I, I've, been, I've been helped by the system, by Carlton. I've been helped. So I feel that I got to be back. So I feel good because I'm being back. I have a reasonable understanding of the purpose of life, and to me it's very important. I know why we're here, I know that we're here to make good, I know that we're here to build, I know we're here. I have, I have that very good feeling, and it makes me very happy. And I think it will make anybody happy if you believe that you really understand what's going on in life. Not that I understand life fully, but I have a, a decent level of understanding that makes me comfortable with life and myself. Questionable. <laughs> I have achieved my objective, not my potential. 
if you ask me now, I can do a lot more than what I did. I could have started my business in that last area. My wife was always trying to make me leave Hydro every time I was unhappy, but Hydro treated me very well, so I stayed longer than I should. Actually, at one point in time, Hydro was downsizing and asked me, would you take this division and run it as a private business and will subsidize it for the first five years? And I said no, because you want me to give, you want me to take all the employees, and I didn't believe that all were good enough to be taken with me. So I said no in principle. I said I can't be handicapped by you giving me the people you want. If you want me to start, I'll have to choose my own. They said, no, we want you to take everybody so that we don't have to lay them off. Maybe that would have been a good idea. I don't know. So I did not achieve my, I don't know if I achieved my potential, but I can tell you, knowing what I know, I have more potential than I did. So I did not achieve my potential. Sometimes you question the vision. You have a vision. Is that the vision the right vision? I think it's OK, but you sometimes you question the vision. The other thing is that, and that's a lesson on life I want to convey to you, there's always a wake to everything you do, OK? There is a wake. Every lift must produce drag. Life is inefficient. So lift produces drag. And I spent four years of my life doing experimental work to find a way to get rid of the wake behind an aircraft so it does not hurt the aircraft behind, behind it. And what I realized after all these years, you can't. If you want the lift, you have to have the drag. You just have to manage the drag. And you have to understand that without a lift, without a drag, there's no lift. This is exactly the same principle everywhere in life. If you have a stature, it has a wake. You have money, it has a wake. Whatever you have that's lift has an associated wake. So you have to be willing to deal with that, and you have to be willing to expect that. I don't think I expected that. So from that perspective, I failed to realize what the wake of what I want would look like in order to be prepared for it, OK? Not that I'm fumbling, but I did not do a good job expecting the wake. OK, let's talk about somebody else. Visionaries is whose vision, Bill Gates. His vision was a computer in every desk and in every home. Look how simple this vision is. Look how simple. A computer on every desk in every home. When personal computer did not exist, but it's a vision. Okay? And he believed in it, and he done it. And in the process, I'm almost certain he got a collateral value of being the richest man in the world. I think he just achieved this vision. And I believe, and I, I read about him a little bit, I believe that when he achieved that, he looked for a different vision. And his different vision now is an offers the opportunity to dramatically improve the quality of life of billions of people. One vision, completed, done, he thinks it. When he does that, that's when I start loving him. Before I used to hate him. I start <laughs> not that it matters to him anyhow, but that is, that is, I saw a different man in there, okay? It's a man with a vision to do good. And good was one thing when he was building a computer. Good was something else when we had the money and he could do something different. Another person whose vision was Warren Buffett. His vision was to generate as much wealth for himself and for his stakeholder as possible. And he did. He's probably the second richest man in the world. The only problem with his vision, it didn't have an end goal. He just wanted to build it forever. And when he asked, he was hoping that when he dies, his wife will take the money and use it for charity. And they said, oh, why didn't you give it to charity earlier? They said, because I could do it better than him. Life did not help him because his wife died before him. And as a result, he has to change the vision and give the money to, or commit to give the money to Bill Gates Foundation to do charity work. But he's still building the money. So he has a vision. He's achieved it. I'm not sure that he feels he achieved it because it's an open-end vision. It's not a bad one. OK. So two more Zakis, or two months in life listens. Life is an eternal compromise. You have to compromise. There is nothing for nothing. You know, everything you get, you have to pay for it. Okay? So management, including management and business management, and life management is a continuous act of making a compromise. You make a compromise from here to here, you make a compromise from here to here, you make a compromise. It's a continuous act of making a compromise. You don't expect to get it all. You always have to pay something to get something else. There's no perfect information. Define pass or clear recipe for right and wrong. Okay. It's not very clear. You have to ask yourself, is that right or is that wrong? Is that right or is that wrong? 
We managed by trial and error. Okay? I could not have gotten from Egypt to where I am right now without trial and errors, without choices, without compromises. The key to overall success is to be cognizant that mistakes will happen, trials will fail, and to act prudently so that when you're doing something right, you do a lot more of it. And when you do something wrong, try to dampen that a little bit. So you overall, the total will be upward, okay? So there's no straight path to glory. It's just full of this and this and this. The other thing is that life is ironic. It gives us a complex plane, brain that can take us to Mars now, not just to the moon. So it propels us to outer space in a rocket. You can split an atom and create a nuclear bomb. You can have a library in your hand now, okay? So this is how powerful we become. A lot of information, a lot of power to destroy, to build, and to do to the moon. A lot of power. Yet, we left, it left us driven by the same instinctive emotion like animals, okay? We, as, we are as primitive today in our feeling as we were yesterday, 100 years ago. We did not evolve as much in our emotion, which means that it's not enough for you to know. You also have to control your emotion. You will also have to draw your drive. You also have to, you have to realize that as a human, you need certain energy, certain focus, certain power to make sure that you could use your brains in a, in a, in a, in a beautiful way. And that's it. I love it when I get questions, so you can ask me anything you want. Please. You can. Yes, you can. So when you're looking for having a vision, and a vision is going to come to you, okay? It's just the fact that you know that if you have a vision, you can capture it, and you believe you can, is the only thing that can make you good. If you don't believe you can, you won't. Okay? But you can. So if I'm, if I'm trying to convey something to you, it's not, I am successful at all. Is that, no, you can. Okay? No matter how much you derail, you can. Okay? Life is not just linear. It's not just you do this. No, no, no. Okay? You do this. Did I answer you? Yeah. You can. I know that the, the Royal Bank of uh, the RBC came up with a button that says, yes, we can. And people look at it trivially. Oh, yes, we can. It's actually, yes, you can. Yes, we can. If you want to, you could. If you don't want to, you absolutely can't. So you have to want to, okay? I believe that actually the desire to want, become, we become lazy at wanting. Okay? You don't want to want because if you want, you have to do something, you become lazy. And that's what detracts us from getting what we want. So if you want, you believe you can, you will. Thank you for taking the time, Dr. Rumley, and speaking today. Um, what do you personally do to overcome the primitive emotions and stay on track? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. We are more transparent than we believe, OK? We are more transparent than we believe. And people can see through you more than you believe. And I, I'm going to use the word again. I hate bullshit because it's inefficiency, OK? So realize that people can read through you. You can read through people. Use your ability to through people and trust it. And realize that whatever you think, people can see. And if you do that, then you become a lot more efficient in dealing with people. You don't have to waste a lot of effort 
managing the emotion and so on. You just go straight to the point, and that will actually kind of empower you. Because sometimes we're afraid to insult. I don't mean you insult. I mean sometimes we're just afraid to say the truth because it's insultive. Or sometimes we don't want to say the right thing because somebody may come back at us for it. Getting rid of that inhibition will actually make you stronger in dealing with these things. You know what I'm saying? Just don't inhibit yourself. Don't inhibit yourself because that's a wasted energy. Use all your energy in a positive way, not in a negative way. So avoid the negative energy. Avoid the negative friends. Okay. And I'll get the, and avoid the negative drugs. And over the negative smoke. It's all negative. It has no value, no redeeming value. Anything that does not have a redeeming value to you takes away from the other things that you could do with your, with your energy. So actually, no, that's a very good question. Avoid all negative things in life to the extent possible. Uh, so something that I've started doing um, a couple of months ago, I started reading more books because I find them very valuable. Um, so are there any books in particular that you'd recommend us to read? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Any book you feel like. You see, you will absorb. No, that's a very good question, actually. Extremely good question. I read different things at different times. At one point, I was reading philosophy. Why? Because I couldn't understand management without understanding philosophy. So I realized that I need to read a little bit about philosophy. When I started reading about philosophy, I learned one thing that's very, very important. I learned that I'm no different than any other man. This is a human relation. Just recognizing that makes you realize that, oh, OK, because now you have a wider circle of people to learn from, not just from yourself. Because you, I started at one point or another learning. One, one, actually, I didn't. Somebody gave me, one, one of my colleagues gave me uh, a set of tapes called The Psychology of Achievement by Brian, somebody or another. But there's many versions of that. And there were seven tapes, seven, seven hours. And he said, Zach, you'll, you'll benefit from that. And I listened to them. And again, they taught me that two things, actually. They taught me that I'm a person like everybody else, and my feelings and my emotions are the same. But they also taught me that some of my, str my strengths can be programmable, can be programmed. So for example, I learned that we all have a subconscious, and the subconscious works all the time. And as a result, it gives you results. It happened to me when I was at Carlson University. I was trying to develop a, a couple of equations where two, anyhow, I was trying to calibrate a probe and there was a couple of things and I dreamed the, the solution. So I knew that I dreamed the solution. So when the guy was teaching me this, I realized, oh my gosh, you mean I can program myself? So I start programming myself. So if I'm going a long trip like to Ottawa, I ask myself, what answer do I want to take back home with me when I'm on the plane? because I know I can program my subconscious. So that set of tapes taught me how about to program my subconscious, okay? I read another set of managed books about, about blue collar worker versus white collar worker. And the thesis of, this, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the book was very simple. It's people who use brains, you can't whip them. And as a result, you have to entice them. And oh my gosh, it's a very simple principle. Oh yeah, I know that. What I'm trying to say to you, no, read. Read as much as you want, but read the books that you feel that you're going to connect with so that you can get the message, OK? There's a few books by, uh, you can see I, I keep forgetting names. Um, my gosh. There's a series of books, and it's very good because it reflects on, on, on life. Give me a sec. It's like by the guy that wrote the, work, the, the book Blink. He wrote the, word, the, the book Blink. So if you look at the book Blink, there will be another few books there. He's quite entertaining. So you can learn a lot while being entertained. Before you get into management and psychology and so on, you may want to read some of those books, of his books, because he makes those things easy to understand and easy to relate to. Books are great. Hello, sir. Um, throughout your work in management, what have you found has been the best way to motivate and empower people? Say that again, sorry. Uh, what have you found throughout your work and experience has been the best way to motivate and empower people? What is that? You missed 
uh, the best way to motivate and empower people from your experience? Like, say you're working, would it be money or... Uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, now I understand you. Yeah. Unless you're selling drugs, nobody should go for money as the object. Okay? Money is the collateral value you get for doing something good. So you ask yourself, what value can I add in this area? And that's what you get paid for. Even if you Michael Jackson, with a couple of moves that makes everybody happy, that's the value, okay? He gets paid for that, okay? If he wants to go pay money directly, you would not be Michael Jackson, okay? So look for the thing that has value. Look for value. Ask yourself, what can I add value? If you find where you can add value, you'll find your vision. But always ask yourself, what can I add value? What can I get value? I work, you work hard. You know, when I, when I was at BC Hydro, and I have to tell you this, when I was at BC Hydro, I rose through the ranks, okay? I started as an assistant engineer, and I became an executive vice president in 17 years. I don't think anybody at BC Hydro have ever done that, okay? Ever. So I wrote that in 17 years. I had one principle when I was there, okay? Is that I always have to make them feel they're underpaying me. Okay? So I have to do more. I, it's not conscious. I'm just saying, why should they pay me if I don't demonstrate? So I demonstrate. When I demonstrate, they promote you. When they promote you, they pay you. I never went for the promotion. I went, never went for the pay. I went for what can I do? for them to see my value or to have a higher value from me. When I went there back in 1977, I used to use a PDB computer over here. I decided to buy a computer over there, and I took some of the problem that a lot of the technologists was dealing with, and I programmed them, and I gave them those answers so that they don't have to spend a lot of time working with this. So you have to add value. I wasn't really looking for a promotion at all. I was looking for an adding value. When I went there, I knew I could add value because I was an assistant engineer. I'm a guy with a PhD that wrote four papers in one year. So how am I not going to be able to add value? But I can't walk in there and say, oh, I wrote four papers, pay me more. No. Why would they? They would only do that if I deliver. And once I, de once I delivered, in two years, there was a supervisory job after two years. And it was between me and somebody who's got a lot of experience. And the company has to go like this. And they struggled, OK? They finally gave it to me. Why? Hardware worker, OK? Willing to share. The other guy was a very good guy. Like, I felt sorry for him. But he wasn't, his focus was not do as much as you can. His focus was, I do a good job. And he's a very good engineer, OK? When I left, I was 10 steps ahead of him. And he was there because he put as much as he got paid for. So don't go for the money. Go for what would get you the money, OK? Go for the value, and then you get the money. Bill Gates didn't say, I want to be the richest man in the world. He said, I want to have a computer in every hand. And I believe that he wanted that from a social perspective, not from a, OK? He didn't say, oh, and that will make you a billionaire. I don't think he ever thought that way. But he became a billionaire. How do you limit uh, distractions, which uh prevent you from reaching the next milestone in a timely manner? Oh my gosh. You guys are good. How do I stay in distraction? Boop, 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 boop. I talked about negative energy, OK? But I also believe, and I believe that since I was about 12 years old, so I'm not telling you something that I found when I was 72. I always believe that you can force yourself to be positive. So when I was a kid and I was running into a problem, I would force myself to whistle. Because if I force myself to whistle, after a little while, I'll get into tune and I get out of my misery. OK? When I, I'm not as good at it anymore when I'm now. When I'm sitting there and I'm not happy, I said, put on a happy face. That is a very powerful statement. You put on a happy face, you will be happy. And it's not bullshit, believe me. You say, I'm going to be happy. And you make, you make an effort, you whistle it, you'll be happy. Okay. So you can work on yourself. And it's, to me, you, we can all work on ourselves. 
if we have our conf have confidence in our ability to do that. Okay? Your confidence, your ability to do that is, that's why I'm trying to say to you, no, there's a plastic equation that solves everything. There is Zach that did all of these things. Books makes you do that. So you, you read and you, you enrich yourself to make sure that you become qualified enough to have that confidence in yourself. Okay, it's not just confidence, stupid confidence. I mean, confidence that if I read, I'll learn. If I do, I'll reach. It's, it's a confidence that I, if I try, I'll get there, not a confidence that, oh, it will come to me. Did I answer you? Just be positive. Just insist. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you. We really appreciated you sharing your experience and insight with us, and I'm sure all of us have learned something and will take away something out of this. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It's a small souvenir for the <laughs> Thank you.